The coronavirus continues to spread at speed. This time last week, we were talking about cases in under 40 countries. Now that figure is 67. There are also close to 90,000 cases worldwide, and the global death toll has gone past 3,000. Crucially, the vast majority of new cases are outside China. Here's the latest from the World Health Organization. We are in uncharted territory. We have never seen before a, resp a, res a respiratory pathogen that's capable of community transmission, but at the same time, which can also be contained with the right measures. While the European Union has set up a special task force to try and manage this crisis, we heard from the President of the European Commission earlier. The risk level has risen from moderate to high for people in the European Union. In other words, the virus continues to spread. So that risk level is the second highest available at the EU. And we know that Italy is by far the worst affected country in Europe. It has over well, close to 1,700 cases and the death toll has gone past 50. Next on the list would be Germany with 150 cases. And as you can see in this clip, caution abounds in Germany and elsewhere. Here we have Angela Merkel going to shake the hands of her interior minister. Thanks, but no thanks, was the response. And health experts have been emphasising that good hand hygiene is essential to containing this virus. And that point was picked up by Boris Johnson today. The single most useful thing that we can all do to support our NHS to stop the spread of uh, coronavirus is to wash our hands. Two times happy birthday, hot water and, and soap. Boris Johnson talking about happy birthday. That's because the World Health Organization recommends singing that song twice while you wash your hands. That means you've done it for long enough. Well, if the WHO is trying to stop this escalating worldwide, in China, well, really, the crisis has already escalated. And we've learned a lot from what's happened in China. This chart shows us the fatality rate and how it increases exponentially by age. See how the vast majority of deaths have been in people of 70 or older. We also know that 90% of all the deaths worldwide have been in Hubei province in China, which is where the outbreak began. For example, just today, China confirmed another 42 deaths there. Here's Robin Brandt in Hong Kong on that. What's most significant uh, about those is that all those deaths occurred in the province of Hubei. That is the place where this all began. Uh, there are no new deaths across the rest of mainland China, according to these figures from the government. And as we say every day, we have to rely on these official figures from the government. So that seems to be yet fresh evidence that the draconian measures put in place essentially to lock down that province of uh, Hubei do appear to be being successful in terms of trying to prevent the spread, the further spread, uh, across the rest of uh, China. So as Robin was saying, those draconian measures involve what is effectively a full lockdown in Hubei province. And look at the consequences. These are pictures from a major railway station in Wuhan, which is the biggest city in Hubei. This is a city of 11 million people. And you can see it looks like it's deserted. And we're learning lots of things about how the government's going about enforcing that lockdown. This is an interesting report from the New York Times. It tells us China is now requiring people to use software on their smartphones, which tells them where they can go. People are also being given color codes that indicate their health status. And then that data from the app is shared with police. This story is by a tech reporter called Paul Mazur. Here he is tweeting, many who have red or yellow codes now lead lives as partial pariahs with the digital scarlet letter, they can't go out or return to work. Plenty don't understand why their code is red or yellow. Yet, when they call up a complaint hotline, it's generally busy. And these restrictions, we should say, are very unlikely to disappear anytime soon. Let's hear from the WHO on the situation in China. What they're planning for is this could remain for some time, uh, maybe some time till there's a vaccine, so we will have the capacities to be able to manage it and run society and the economy and everything else the way we need to and not lock people down to try and, and, uh, and, and, and manage this. Well, South Korea is the worst affected country outside of China. Let me show you some of the pictures from there. This is in Daegu in the south of South Korea. You can see streets are being disinfected. And just today, South Korea has reported close to 500 new cases. That takes its total to more than 4,000. And three quarters of these cases are linked to one religious sect, which is led 
by this man, Lee Man He. This is him issuing an apology and asking for forgiveness. He has around 140,000 followers in South Korea, and he's been accused of not releasing details of that membership quickly enough, which in turn, the accusation runs, impacted on South Korea's response. Moving from South Korea, we shift to Tehran in Iran. This is footage from inside one hospital. We know there are now 15,000 confirmed cases, though it is far from clear if that figure is accurate. Well, of course, this is a global health emergency, but it's also posing a threat to the global economy. The OECD is a multinational group that analyzes things like the global economy. Go back to November, it was predicting global growth of 2.9%. It's now revised that prediction to 2.4%. Here's the OECD's chief economist. But there's also the possibility that the epidemic spreads through North America, Europe uh, and the Asia-Pacific, like Japan and Australia, in which case we will have the same quarantine and travel bans as what we have seen in China or similar, and that would slice uh, the growth that we were protecting in November 3% down to 1.5%. Well, some companies are shifting how they're working in response to this crisis. For example, the Japanese manufacturer Sharp mostly makes electronic goods. Now it's using one of its TV factories to produce face masks because they're running out of them in Japan. And that's despite health experts warning they do very little to actually protect against airborne infection. Over the weekend, there was a sharply worded tweet from the US Surgeon General Seriously, people, stop buying masks. They're not effective in preventing general public from catching the coronavirus, but if healthcare providers can't get them to care for sick patients, it puts them and our communities at risk. And just picking up on these pressures, uh, this is out of our newsroom in Washington. Um, according to Evergreen Health in Washington State, six patients have now died after testing positive. There have been five deaths of residents of King County, plus one death in Snohomish County, all six people were patients. So Washington State in the northwest of the US now confirming six deaths connected to the coronavirus. And here's one American doctor on the potential stresses the hospitals will face if this crisis continues to expand in the US. What causes me the most concern is whether or not our hospital systems are able to deal with the medical surge that's going to happen. We know that our hospitals operate near capacity all the time, and some hospitals may be strained when they get a surge of patients, many of whom will have mild illness, but will still put a burden on hospitals in terms of the emergency departments, the intensive care units for the more sick patients, as well as just, uh, in general, hospital operations. Making sure our hospitals can cope with this, that's the biggest concern I have.